Hello, everybody, and welcome to Commotion Labs Fundamentals for Startups. I'm Brady Ryan, manager of Commotion Labs' brand new hardware incubator. For those of you who are new to us, Commotion Labs provides uh, multi-industry lab system hosting at startups inside and outside of the UW community in life sciences, biotech and health tech, medical devices, robotics and hardware, software and IT, and fintech. Our startups range from pre-C to Series A, employing 2 to 15 people each, and are variously headed by students, faculty, and community leaders, with both new and seasoned entrepreneurs represented. While we wait for everyone to log in to this meeting, I'll make a few announcements. Next week, uh, Yijan Niao, Managing Director of Alliance of Angels, will discuss startup valuation. Um, all of our fundamentals and startup presentations are archived on our Comotion website under labs slash startup training videos. We've covered a wide variety of topics over the last several years. So if you find yourself with some free time, uh, please feel free to check out the past talks. For the full schedule and to register for future fundamentals, please visit comotion.uw.edu slash events. This year, we're proud to partner with Bluetooth to support the Fundamentals for Startups program. See how Bluetooth audio sharing is poised to once again change the way you will experience audio and connect with the world around you. Bluetooth introduced the world to wireless audio. Calling, listening, watching, making us safer more productive, more joyful. It's part of the fabric of our lives. Now, Bluetooth will bring us even closer to each other and our world with audio sharing. It will let us share with others our music, experiences, listening and watching together. The places we go will share with us, enriching our experiences, helping us hear our world. Breaking down barriers between interests, cultures, generations. Introducing Bluetooth audio sharing. Closer. Together. And how fitting uh, that our first speaker is from Bluetooth SIG. Uh, today, Jim Katsandris is here to discuss latest advancement in Bluetooth technology and its rapid growth in non-consumer devices. Uh, I think like most people, I think of Bluetooth as a very consumer thing, headphones especially. Uh, turns out there's a whole lot more. Uh, Jim leads the developer relations activities at Bluetooth SIG. His international team works to provide developers the information and resources they need to create the next generation of Bluetooth-enabled products and services. Jim has been in the Internet of Things, cloud and device space for over 25 years, working across different vertical markets and technologies, including industrial, smart buildings and cities, energy and smart grid, entertainment and theme parks, mathematical optimization and modeling, and AI. He has also had the opportunity to work across platform technology, software as a service, embedded original equipment manufacturer, manufacturer, systems integrator, independent software vendor, and consulting organizations. Jim will take all questions via chat. Feel free to use the chat on the sidebar. Uh, and I will now turn the event over to Jim. Great. Thanks, Brady. Thanks for having me on. Um, most people uh, um, think of Bluetooth as a consumer technology. Um, and, uh, and it might not be familiar, though, with the Bluetooth Special Interest Group. Uh, the Bluetooth SIG um, it has three main functions. Um, the first function is specifications. What it does is it, we bring our members together to create the specifications that become the next uh, versions of Bluetooth technology. And um, we do those through specifications, and then our member companies go off and, and build the products that you would go and, and put into your home or your manufacturing plant, um, hospitals, um, many different areas. And we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, the second thing that the Bluetooth SIG does is qualification. So um, the reason why you can go and purchase a, a Bluetooth speaker or a um, electronic scale that has Bluetooth capability anywhere in the world and have it work with your phone um, 
that's basically a result of our world-class qualification program, which makes sure that if uh, there's a Bluetooth logo on it, that um, it'll interoperate um, with all the other Bluetooth devices. And then the, the third thing that we do at the Bluetooth SIG is promotion, which is really get the word out um, about what Bluetooth offers and all the different uh, interesting areas that it's uh, being um, used. And so that's um, what the Bluetooth um, SIG is. Uh, we're a not-for-profit organization um, um, for the, um, you know, the Bluetooth technology. And uh, Bluetooth, uh, we have a very large uh, membership. Um, it's worldwide. As you can see, it's dispersed across the world. And there's 36,000 um, plus member companies, um, and that continues to grow. And those are the companies that are actually building all the Bluetooth devices, um, are doing things with Bluetooth um, worldwide. As you can see, um, uh, you know, 34% from the Americas, 37% from Asia Pacific, um, uh, close thirty percent from AMIA uh, make up the membership, and these members um, are shipping a lot of Bluetooth devices. Um, it's growing worldwide in all those regions. Um, today, uh, eleven million Bluetooth devices ship. So every single day, eleven million Bluetooth devices ship um, to customers, um, and that's going to grow to approximately seventeen million a day by twenty twenty four. So you can see the growth, and so. Not only do we have a, a large, active, diverse community of members, um, they're also um, shipping a lot of devices and that area is growing. And, and we'll talk a lot about the growth there. Um, for consumer devices, you know, oftentimes they'll grow as fast as the consumer market, but a lot of growth is also coming from the non-consumer um, space. We'll talk a little bit more about that um, shortly. So um, Bluetooth, you can think of Bluetooth as a solution-oriented type technology. So it, people are familiar with the audio streaming capability. Um, so those are your wireless headsets. If you want to do wireless speakers or smart speakers, if you want to do devices for the car, for um, you know, um, streaming music, um, answering your phone, those are all um, audio streaming capabilities. Um, but uh, the other solution area that we have is data transfer. So that's if you want to get data transferred between two devices. Um, so those are your sports and fitness devices, health and wellness devices, whether that's medical equipment, implantable uh, medical equipment, uh, scales, um, peripherals and accessories. Uh, those are like keyboards and mice and, and um, you know, uh, many of the other types of uh, devices that you use every day. And then another solution area that is, we have is location services. And we'll talk a little bit more in deeply about this one um, shortly. But this is uh, the ability to understand your location or proximity to other people or devices. Um, so uh, you would see this in like point of interest um, scenarios, like if you're in a museum and you get close to a work of art and it starts um, talking in your headset or coming up on your cell phone. Um, it's doing that because there's a Bluetooth device behind it. And as you get close to it, um, it's creating that uh, interaction um, with the user. There's also navigation and wayfinding. Um, navigation is like what it means navigating, um, and, you know, and wayfinding is finding your way inside a building like an airport. Um, so I have a, my Delta app, but I'm not traveling very much anymore. But when I did, I could open it up in an airport and it's uh, reading, um, you know, thousands of beacons put out through the airport and um, I can find my little um, uh, location on my uh, map of the airport. So kind of like a GPS like indoor um, functionality. And then item and asset tracking, which is being able to track an item um, through a building or an asset through a building or on a hospital floor, um, in a warehouse, um, those type of uh, location based services. And then, um, it's less common that people know about um, Bluetooth and device networks. So um, we'll talk a little bit more about that as well. Um, this is where you ha can have a Bluetooth mesh network inside a building um, and you can actually uh, um, control the lighting system with it, the commercial lighting system, HVAC systems. You could be in a manufacturing plant. You could be monitoring uh, sensors, uh, the, uh, the health of each of the equipments. Um, 
um, and get that information back wirelessly. So if we look at um, the Bluetooth community um, in action, our members came together in 2016 to actually uh, improve the speed, actually add an option for higher speed Bluetooth connectivity, um, or you could have longer range um, or bigger broadcast, which is the amount of information that comes out, let's say in a, a Bluetooth beacon. Um, and and um, the range was already really uh, long for Bluetooth, but we'll, I'll show you some examples where the Bluetooth point-to-point uh, -point, uh, communication and uh, beacons can go over a kilometer. And then in 2017, our members came together and created Bluetooth mesh networking um, that I just mentioned previously. And the emphasis for doing that was commercial lighting. So being able to turn off or on thousands of lights or um, in a stadium or within a commercial building and do it with no human perceptible delay and no popcorning, which means the lights all come on at once or off at once, um, some don't lag. Um, and so that was actually, um, very uh, complicated to do. You really couldn't do it with the existing mesh networking or the existing wireless uh, connectivity. Um, and so lighting um, companies and our silicon vendors came together to create mesh networking um, for Bluetooth. And then um, um, in uh, 2019, they added direction finding, which I'll talk about um, in a little more in detail. Um, that's basically the ability to determine the direction of a Bluetooth signal. Um, and not just uh, the strength of it. And then um, over the next year or so, we're gonna be releasing um, our next generation of Bluetooth audio, as you saw in the, um, the uh, video. Um, what's in interesting about that is there's a couple um, really interesting features there that I'm gonna go over um, that are applicable not only to consumers, but also to um, uh, non-consumer spaces. So uh, let's talk a little bit more about um, Bluetooth uh, mesh networks. Uh, it's a, a secure network. Um, it allows um, for many nodes, thousands of nodes to be connected together. Um, so it basically allows uh, Bluetooth devices, let's say if they're in the lights or electrical outlets, to pass messages through each other. And they do that in a, in a secure way. Um, and it also allows um, for interoperability. So you can actually have uh, lights, let's say it's in commercial lighting, you can have lights made from three different manufacturers um, all working on um, seamlessly on the same Bluetooth mesh network, whether that's in your home or that's in your factory, your hospital. Um, and the way we get this interoperability is from models. Um, these are uh, descriptions of complete functionality. So like in a commercial lighting control, the models determine how the lights shall behave if they're dimmed, how it shall handle color, how it shall handle all the different characteristics of um, lighting. And it's defined um, down completely so that uh, different companies can, if they implemented those models in their lights, they're um, guaranteed to be interoperable. And uh, another advantage of uh, Bluetooth mesh networking is um, since lights are everywhere, or at least they're everywhere where humans are, um, you can actually uh, add additional services onto these lights. So you can add by ad adding um, uh, software or sensors onto them, you can actually have a, a lighting as a platform. And, and so like in a building where you might have commercial lighting, you can turn off and on the lights, uh, different offices can turn on their own lights, but you also, those lights could be tracking um, assets or products as it goes into your warehouse and through your hospital floor. Um, and, uh, or you could use that to find your way within a building. So a lot of um, interesting uh, value can be added um, for little additional cost um, on, um, a, a Bluetooth mesh network. So a little bit about how it works. Um, so here I'm using the lighting example where there's a Bluetooth light switch and a Bluetooth light, um, and there can be many of them. And what's happening is, is they, the, the switch is sending out a Bluetooth signal and um, it can be heard from any of the uh, nodes within its range. And then there's special nodes that we have called relay nodes that can actually relay the message. So the nodes, uh, communicate um, with each other. There's no, it, hubs or routers are not required. Um, so there's no single point of failure. If you wanted to get the Bluetooth 
you know, if you want to control it or get the information back to a commercial lighting system or to the internet, you can you could add a hub if you wanted. Um, but the Bluetooth technology doesn't require hubs or routers to work. Um, and so there's no, no single point of failure. If one of those nodes fails, um, the system will continue on. And because uh, these uh, devices are broadcasting out, um, uh, there, if you have one of the devices that fails, your, your bolt's burnt out or it's, you break it, um, uh, you, that uh, light won't affect the rest of the system. Um, and then when you went to go replace that light, you only have to configure it with the information that was in that one light. You don't have to reconfigure your system in any way. Um, and then it's a managed, uh, what we call managed flooding. And basically uh, we do things um, to make sure that, um, you know, the, the messages are uh, delivered efficiently um, and safely. And then we also have what's called a low power node. So if you have a sensor on the wall, let's say it's, it's measuring, um, you know, it might be measuring temperature or pressure. And if it goes between up above a certain level, then it will wake up and send the message to what's called a friend node. So a, a node that's close to it. Um, and then it can go back to sleep. And the same way the friend node will uh, cache messages for it and go back. So um, it's a published subscribe model. Um, so you can have light switches and, um, you know, that's that are programmed to say hallway lights on and the, the bulbs, the lights that are listening for that can turn themselves um, on when they hear that message. So, like I mentioned, um, these models um, are uh, the way of interoperability. It's very similar to profiles um, that you have now. If you have the same profile on your phone as your car, then they can communicate um, flawlessly together. So this is the, when I was talking about the lighting as a platform, you can have it in the lights, you can have advanced lighting control, location wayfinding, asset tracking, all in the light itself. Yeah. And so obviously that's of value to people who wanna do devices and maybe offer services on top of that um, as well. So with uh, Bluetooth Mesh, you can actually have multiple applications running at the same time, multiple models. So you can have lighting, you can have your air conditioning, you can have locks on your doors, and they, they, each one is cryptographically separated, so they're secure in their own lights, so, so there's no um, sharing of information um, across those different areas. Same thing in stores, um, lighting, pricing on shelves, uh, electronic pricing, um, airports, you can do indoor navigation, they could be part of lights, um, many different um, opportunities there. And so um, Bluetooth mesh networking, um, although most people haven't really heard about it, it's, uh, it's actually undergoing um, dramatic growth. Um, matter of fact, the number of qualified devices has been doubling um, uh, every six months since it was introduced. Um, as you can see, there's um, a lot of devices shipping and a lot more um, uh, gonna be shipping in the next uh, three to four years. So if we look at, Data transfer, um, I mentioned that you can have longer range. The range was um, extended um, to be able to go four times what it would normally be able to go. And, and for these non-consumer spaces, so that's handy for homes and, and, and you know, large homes and, and those types of uh, uh, environments, but it's also good at helping the signal go farther in challenging environments where there's lots of walls or there's a lot of medical, uh, metal around, um, you know, in industrial um, type settings. And so that ability to get through the message across is, um, is very uh, important. And it does uh, some type of uh, uh, technology to make that happen through forward error correction, better receivers, uh, selectivity, uh, sensitivity. And then really right now you can see Bluetooth um, devices communicating well over a kilometer. And if you're interested in that, um, go to bluetooth.com slash range or just search range on our website. And there's lots of interesting videos um, about the range of Bluetooth and how far it is. Um, and they take these Bluetooth devices out over a kilometer and, and it's still communicating. 
uh, for a higher speed, it increased the, the speed that you can um, do it uh, from one megabit per second to two megabit per second. And then also higher capacity, which is fueling the beacon, Bluetooth beacon technology, which I'll talk about in a little bit. I won't go into detail about um, this, but this beacons are used often for um, proximity um, detection. Um, also, I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, how it's been used in COVID-19 um, um, uh, solutions. So it's just some examples of non-consumer spaces. ABB, um, they use uh, wireless Bluetooth-enabled sensors to detect uh, and, and protect the low-voltage motors. Um, and out of that, they could um, do some predictive analytics, and they reduced um, their uh, unplanned downtime by about 70%, uh, and extended the motor life for up to 30%. So these are an example. Um, Bosch uh, uses Bluetooth to um, uh, keep track of assets through the supply chain, so through the logistics. Um, and so it's not just, uh, you know, if something does happen in the middle of it or, you know, they'll, they can actually determine, you know, whether, um, you know, what happened to it and when along the path that it did happen. So data transfer, um, very strong growth. Uh, as you can see, um, with one, one and a half billion devices shipping by the end of 2024. And that doesn't include cell phones, uh, laptops, or iPads. Those are actually just Bluetooth, um, the, the other uh, non-platform type devices. So now let's look at um, location services. Uh, so when we talk about location services, we break it up into proximity solutions which basically uh, determines how close you are to another device, or positioning uh, systems, which uh, uh, determines your position um, in a map. Um, so it's, it's not relative position, it's actually known position. And so I'll talk a little bit more about that these um, uh, technologies. Now the first generation of this used um, uh, the signal strength, received signal strength of the Bluetooth radio. So if it was stronger, then you were closer. And if it was farther away, um, you were farther away. If it was lower signal, you were farther away. And you could get, you know, meter level accuracy. So approximately, you know, uh, meter level. Um, but now this latest generation, um, our members added the ability to calculate the angle of arrival and angle of departure of the Bluetooth signal. That, adding that to the signal strike, now you're, you can actually get down to centimeter level accuracy with, um, with basically the same radio, um, the same um, cost. So what that means is if you, you, before you might get this close to finding your keys or your car, um, but now with the angle of um, departure, you can actually zero in and, and find out, oh, it's over here, it's in this direction. So now if you're in a um, museum and there's five or six uh, paintings that you, you want, you can actually determine what the direction is or specifically which one um, that um, it is. And then again, in a warehouse, um, you can keep track of uh, workers with lanyards um, or um, forklifts or people or ro robotics, robots, and you can actually now with this kind of accuracy, you can make sure that someone isn't walking around a corner and a robot is coming around or is scheduled to come around that corner. There's a lot of things you can do once you know precisely where something is. So just a little bit about how it, it, it works. Um, in the angle of arrival case, you would have a transmitter with a single antenna and it would send out a special signal um, called a constant tone extension. And then it would be, as the signal goes past the receiver, which has an antenna array, multiple antennas, um, the phase difference is calculated and that and knowing the type of uh, antenna it is, you can actually calculate the angle of arrival. Angle departure, it's similar, um, except the um, transmitter has multiple antennas and it switches between them really quick and sends out a signal. Um, and the receiver picks up this along with the information of the transmitter can determine the angle of departure. Now what's interesting about this scenario is that if you're um, thinking about the beacon case where a 
airport has thousands of beacons. Um, now, what can happen is, is those beacons, if they had multiple antennas, now your device, let's say it's your cell phone, could now calculate your position. So no information needs to be shared. Your, your calculation of where you are is done on your phone. It doesn't have to be done um, in a system in the cloud somewhere um, or another machine on premise. And it also takes the burden away from the transmitter to do the calculation. And so now you can actually have tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people um, knowing their position um, at the same time, uh, similar to like GPS-like indoor um, capability and do it at the centimeter level accuracy. So, um, so not just people uh, or assets can be tracked, you can actually track um, different things like hockey players and hockey pucks. Um, one of our member companies, uh, Coupa, is partnered with Wise Hockey, and they actually have these stadiums um, throughout Europe and actually soon elsewhere, um, where they actually have a Bluetooth beacon in the hockey puck, and it's beaconing out at 50 times a second. And then they have a Bluetooth beacon on the uniform of each of the players, and that's beaconing out at 20 times a second. And so now they can actually, with two readers on the ceiling of the hockey stadium, they can actually track these players and the hockey pucks and calculate accelerations and velocities all in real time. And so uh, that's really helpful for the coaches. Um, you know, it's, it's helpful for Las Vegas odds. You know, it's, it's helpful for a lot of different um, things. But uh, that I, I like showing this example because um, People don't usually think of Bluetooth as a real-time location system, and in this case, uh, it is. And there, and they have uh, many other types of examples of tracking, um, but you can do it very quickly, and you can um, get uh, great resolution. Um, for tags, um, you know, Bluetooth uh, might have a battery or a small coin cell battery that lasts ten years or so. You know, Bluetooth is very low power. Um, but there's also companies um, like Williot who actually um, can have Bluetooth beacons that can communicate out um, and they don't require a battery at all. They're harvesting the energy in the existing uh, environment um, to do that. So it's very exciting. Um, and it, you, you can have these printed on um, labels, um, you know, put them on all sorts of devices. Um, so pretty soon you'll be able to track, you know, all products or assets, if you'd like. I already mentioned about the museums. Uh, Bluetooth is used in, in just a tremendous amount of museums worldwide. Um, and here you can do other things with it too. Like I mentioned, um, it can also be part of um, the lighting control system. Um, if you get in and there's you know occupancy sensors, those types of uh, solutions as well. Um, Bosch um, has, uh, they um, have lots of many different products, but they also have um, tools for construction sites and they put uh, a Bluetooth chip in each of their tools and it beacons out every eight, eight seconds. And so this allows uh, people to find tools anywhere on the construction site. And then every so often it, um, uh, the phone um, sends its GPS location back to the, the cloud. So here's an example of using beacons um, and they're not on a wall, you know, they're not um, on a product you can sell, they're just um, helping job sites um, um, find tools. And, and you see the same thing in hospitals too. It's amazing how, you know, beds get misplaced and, and um, carts get misplaced. And, and now with Bluetooth, there's an inexpensive way to keep track of, um, of those assets. Um, I'll just mention um, Pierce Aerospace. They do, uh, they're do uh, involved in drones and, and they were saying that, um, you know, they can maintain a, a Bluetooth connection um, over two kilometers, um, three if it's just beaconing technology. But keep in mind, this is, this is up in the air. There's no walls. There's, you know, this is ideal type situation. But if you would like to learn more, um, yeah, go to bluetooth.com slash range and take a look or, or go to bluetooth.com and just search for range and you'll see lots of videos of this type of uh, uh, use cases, uh, long range um, use for, for Bluetooth. Um, some places where they use uh, Bluetooth and drones is to 
allow them to uh, avoid collisions uh, with each other and formation flying and other types of um, solutions. Target, uh, you're probably familiar with them, large retailer. They are, um, they've switched over to Bluetooth uh, beacons in their lighting system so that they can help customers find products and do um, you know, many other types of uh, solutions. Um, and I already mentioned um, the airports that have Bluetooth beacons. I think I remember it was like 70% or 80% of international airports have um, uh, beaconing, Bluetooth beaconing capabilities. So as you can see, this is an area that there's a lot of opportunity. Um, if you look at um, the growth curve here for, for beacons, there's just a lot of activity, um, 500, uh, close to 540 million um, Bluetooth-based location devices are, are scheduled to ship annually by 2024. We're seeing, um, and again, a lot of um, growth um, in that space. So there's a lot of opportunity um, for companies to build products um, off of this technology and, and, and connect up to that ecosystem. So I'll talk to you a little bit about um, the next generation audio. Although the talk is about non-consumer, this does touch on consumer um, technology a little bit, and it also touches on um, um, a little less consumer as well. So um, LE Audio, it's basically um, audio that you know and love, but on the low energy radio of Bluetooth. Bluetooth actually has two radios, a BR EDR radio, and, and which is what we call classic um, Bluetooth right now. And then it's um, going to be having the capability to do audio over low energy. And a lot of devices will support both, obviously. It comes with a new codec. It's just the ability to compress and decompress um, the audio signal. And it can actually do much higher quality um, for the same power consumption. Or it can do the same quality, actually a little bit better quality than it does now, for a lot lower power. So you can have a lot smaller bar, uh, battery. Um, you're gonna see them in a lot of um, um, uh, uh, smaller devices. And then the ability to multi-stream, which just means highly synchronized streams um, so that you could um, send the signal to the left earbud and the right earbud, um, and you can have a separate signal. Um, you could also stream to different types of um, uh, devices other than audio as well. Um, uh, and then, um, you know, a, a lot of people um, suffer from he um, hearing loss. And what's changing with LE Audio is it's now hearing aids are going to be part of the Bluetooth standard. They're going to be just like your earbuds. So now people with hearing loss can watch their TVs, can can listen to music, can, but it can also hear um, uh, other people. Um, so that's a great um, advancement um, for people with hearing loss. And the one feature I really wanted to point out is um, broadcast audio. Um, so there's two types of broadcast audio, um, personal and location-based. So personal audio is going to mean uh, personal audio sharing is where you can decide, hey, I want a private group of my friends around me um, to listen to what I'm listening and share that experience. Um, or I can um, do it to the, the public around me. Um, I could share an audio stream um, to the public around me. Um, but the one I really wanted to focus on is location audio sharing. So this is where a building or a location or venue or devices in those locations are actually broadcasting Bluetooth audio. So where you might see this is in a workout room where you have five TVs. Um, with Bluetooth, you'll be able to decide which TV you want to listen to, and you could also decide what language you want to listen to it. Same thing with if you're in an audio or a um, theater, a um, um, movie theater, or you're attending a show, you could listen to it in the language, the native language of the film, or you could listen to it in your preferred language. Um, or if you have hearing loss and you have hearing aids, you'd be able to hear the movie um, using your, your regular um, hearing aids. <clears throat> and so this is uh, exciting. And you can also think of in conferences, um, you can have multiple presentations going on at the same time. And if they have Bluetooth headsets or um, earbuds, you can actually just look at whoever you're, you want to listen to and you can select that audio stream. And of course, in the future, you know, with 
knowing the direction of an IO signal, there's even really cool um, possibilities for, you know, turning towards it and hearing that audio or, or pointing at it uh, with your phone or other types of um, interesting combinations. So now um, I'd like to talk to um, you a little bit about <clears throat> Bluetooth technology and the safe return to the workforce. Obviously, we're in the middle of this COVID-19 pandemic. Um, yeah, it's it's um, we're trying to open up places when it's appropriate um, and get uh, you know allow people to go back uh, to work or get other places. So um, let's go through this. So um, Bluetooth technology. Um, we'll talk a little bit about uh, the different types of areas where Bluetooth technology is being used. Um, we like to think of it as uh, three main areas, although it's being used in lots more than this, I'm just uh, categorizing them here. Um, exposure notification systems. So this is where you, um, if someone near you um, has COVID um, and they, um, um, and they uh, uh, go through their, <clears throat> um, health system uh, application and they say, they decide, you know, they say, hey, I have COVID. This is the ability then to notify other people um, who may, you may have been in contact with. And I'll talk a little bit about how that can be done with um, uh, privacy, um, complete privacy. And then the other part is uh, Bluetooth being used in the safe return to your office or factory or school or venues solutions. And those are using proximity-based um, solutions or real-time location system um, uh, solutions. And then safe treatment solutions. So this is like touchless patient, to patient monitoring, uh, wireless devices for that remote or home monitoring, and also um, compliance um, for doctors or people to wash their hands um, before going to another um, client or another patient and those types of solutions. So um, there's actually a lot of efforts worldwide um, uh, to um, look at how to do exposure notification and contact tracing where you uh, determine where um, contact um, was uh, done and, and um, who's involved. Um, most of those systems right now are using um, the Bluetooth uh, receive signal strength. So if you get, if you're close to someone um, and then you later find out, uh, they later find out they have COVID, then you can determine whether you were close to them and, and, and for a length of time um, and potentially could be infected. Um, so as it is now, you know, most of these systems are using your phone or wearable device, um, you know, uh, to be able to determine, you know, whether you're close or not. So um, what's, I don't know if you've seen this, but two of our you know, large member company that came together and to do an exposure notification system. So Apple and Google came together. Of course, that covers most of the um, smartphone market um, between um, iPhones and Android based um, devices. And they came together and they collaborated on a privacy centric approach to this. So it's based on user consent. So you have to opt in. Um, it's a, a decentralized approach, which means um, it's device centric. So there is no, your positioning information is never shared or you're not tracked. Um, and then um, uh, this is becoming more part of the phone and they said they were gonna do this um, just for the COVID-19 um, pandemic. Um, so how it works. So Alice and Bob are near each other. Let's say they don't know each other but they're near each other for a configurable uh, period of time. Um, health organizations can configure this. So let's say they're, on a, they're sharing a park bench and they, you know, they're both sitting together for 10 minutes. So their phones are gonna exchange this anonymous identifier that's changed frequently. So it's just anonymous ID uh, that it's sending and then it's receiving these IDs from other people. So Alice is sending, um, a anonymous ID to Bob, and Bob is sending an analysis or uh, anonymous identifier to Alice. So later, Bob is diagnosed with COVID, 
and he goes to his health organization app online or on his phone, and he voluntarily um, uploads his last latest identifier beaker IDs. Again, these are just IDs. They don't, they're not, um, you know, uh, he's just uh, loading up his that his phone's been sending out to people. Um, then Alice uh, occasionally checks the health org site or app does um, and downloads any um, positive uh, COVID IDs that people have um, put up there. And then her phone then sees, oh, I received, you know, I received one of those. I was near uh, one of those. My phone recorded these um, anonymous IDs. And one matches uh, the one from Bob. Now she doesn't know it's Bob. She doesn't know where it happened. She doesn't know how it is uh, that she came in contact. Um, but now she knows and she might want to then uh, quarantine herself or, or um, go get tested. Um, you know, to, uh, to help with, um, you know, um, the spread of COVID-19 and for her own, um, her own protection. So it's a privacy-centric approach um, and it's uh, opt-in. So other areas um, where Bluetooth technology is helping is with social distancing. So now you're talking about going back to buildings. Um, so it's sometimes it might be valuable to know, well, how many people are in the building or how many people are in each room of the building so that um, you can help um, keep, you know, understand that there's a line here, people are waiting and maybe, you know, there's some opportunity to, um, to do social distancing there. Um, or you're in a building and what's the best way to get out of the building without passing a bunch of people um, or, what surfaces have been used or what parts of the buildings have been used. Um, so um, tr track those kind of activities so that you can do additional cleaning or whatever is appropriate um, in your situation. Uh, and then I, we already talked about exposure notification systems for um, being in proximity to other people who might have it. Um, Bluetooth, um, we, we've had for, uh, we are, we actually have a separate exposure notification working group um, at, at, uh, at the SIG um, specifically for this and it includes SIG members, uh, members, health organizations, medical profession, um, professionals um, to, to, uh, to um, help out, make sure that we can get the best solutions that we can um, um, using Bluetooth technology. So, um, uh, so now um, I wanna kind of bring it back to, now we've looked at a lot of areas for Bluetooth. It's used in many different um, areas um, outside of these areas that I'm highlighting, um, but it offers this worldwide interoperability and you can see the growth um, that we're seeing across, our members are seeing across these, their devices. But why, what are some of the reasons for that growth and why are so many members interested in Bluetooth? Um, not only is it a great technology, but it's actually interoperable across different industries. Um, so it's, you know, whether you're talking um, heating and air conditioning or trying to utilize your spaces more or lighting or audio um, navigation, um, it's, it has this uh, um, compatibility and interoperability across those, but also across geographies. Um, it doesn't matter where your device is made. It doesn't matter where it's sold and it doesn't matter what phone you have, um, these, uh, the interoperability works across those geographies. Um, and then across time. So if you have, um, let's say you have a, a building and you wanna put in Bluetooth lighting, commercial lighting into it, you might uh, you know, have a thousand light switches and a couple thousand lights. Well, 30 years from now, um, and you want to put in a new light, uh, replace the light, or you want to add new features in your light for, for asset tracking or, or whatever. Um, as long as those were Bluetooth logoed, you're guaranteed that they will work together. So you're not going to have to rip out stuff and replace it because the reason why that is, is because Bluetooth uh, controls the whole full stack from the Bluetooth radio, it is a Bluetooth radio. It's defined by the, our member companies. Um, and if our members need to change it to do something or add a feature or help in some scenario, um, they can do that and they can do that um, quickly. Um, and they don't have to go and, and lobby another standards body's radio to do it. So um, this kind of control means that um, 
you know, we, uh, our members can, um, you know, guarantee compatibility, interoperability. And then if you want to base, um, you, let's say you have a product that you're manufacturing, let's say it's a, a big drill press or something, and you put, put Bluetooth sensors in it now, um, 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, this equipment might be out there and you want to have new products come out. If you use Bluetooth technology, you'll still know that the sensors that you had in your older um, building are still there. They're, they're, um, it hasn't been um, obsolete and you can create software and solutions that incorporate both of those. So that's uh, um, one of the advantages of Bluetooth technology. And last, um, I wanna leave you with some of the things I'm seeing um, in the world today is I'm starting to see a lot of applications spanning these solution areas. So like these beacons, um, uh, you know, they're part of, they're attached to products and they're part of the logistics. So they're giving data as they go in and then they're put into the back of a warehouse, let's say for a hospital. And now they can know the exact rack and shelf that that product is on um, because it, that beacon is beaconing out for the warehousing. And then let's say that device is now um, put out on a hospital floor. So it's a cart or a wheelchair or a bed. Um, now you can actually track it and, and be able to find it quickly um, you know, uh, throughout a building. Um, and then we're seeing um, combinations of audio and location. So being able to do uh, audio, a specific audio to specific places or, or, or um, areas um, and I, I mentioned already the location services um, and um, you know not only can you find it but you can actually connect to that device um, and get its uh, uh, its uh, data in a secure way so you're starting to see a lot of this type of applications and because Bluetooth is standardized worldwide you can you can get this type of um, synergy so uh, with that I'd like to thank you um, for sharing um, this with me and and uh, um, seeing some of just a glimpse of some uh, use cases of Bluetooth outside of the purely consumer space. Yeah, Jim, thank you for that. That was uh, impressive stuff. Um, potentially the most impressive was getting Apple and Google to play nice <laughs> with each other. Um, they, we have a bunch of questions. Uh, if anybody else has questions, feel free to keep throwing them in the chat. We've got. Uh, about 10 minutes plus to go over these. Uh, so we'll just jump right in. Uh, Diana wanted to know for location and device networking applications, what are the advantages of using Bluetooth over traditional kind of RFID tracking systems? Yeah, that's a good question. So a, a couple things, um, you know, first of all, uh, um, you know, we, we definitely believe in, you know, you use the right technology for the right solution. And there's a lot of solutions that use both RFID and um, Bluetooth. Um, but for um, for specifically, you know, using Bluetooth, one is, is that it does have range um, and it does have uh, uh, speed and it does. And, um, and what it does is for like RFID, um, uh, if you wanted to have, um, you know, uh, readers for those, you have to have specific readers in specific locations. And, you know, um, you might have choke points where you have the devices go back um, and get onto those readers. And so you'd have readers where it would be applicable. Um, some, um, the, for Bluetooth though, not only is there the range, but the ability to add it to other devices. So um, you can put, um, you know, uh, Bluetooth readers anywhere. You could put them in each of your lights or you could put them in their outlets. Um, and a Bluetooth reader is simply just a, um, you know, it's a, a Bluetooth um, chip. Um, so, uh, you know, those are some of the um, advantages. And the other advantages are it's, it's uh, Bluetooth is natively supported on, you know, all 100% of all phones, tablets, and PCs as well. So you, you, you could also use Bluetooth to get more information out of it, and you could do that in a secure way with a phone. So those are just uh, you know a few of, of those, but really you see um, solutions with RFID as well as Bluetooth, and it just depends on on um, you know your specific uh, requirements. 
Sure. Uh, Shane Claggett, who is our newest member here in the hardware space, uh, wants to know if Bluetooth is a viable option for streaming significant quantities of data like high-resolution video or kind of where that tipping point is where you should uh, switch to Wi-Fi. Yeah, so uh, good question. Um, so Bluetooth is, you know, two megabits per second is the current, you know, maximum that you, you use Bluetooth for. Um, so for, you know, if you're talking about high resolution video and stuff, you would definitely um, switch over there uh, if you needed, you know, um, so many frames per second. And here's where it depends on, you know, compression and the actual implementation of the product. So we do have Bluetooth being used um, in videos, video cameras, security cameras, but, you know, uh, Bluetooth has much higher speed. Um, and Bluetooth actually works really well with, with Wi-Fi. So of course, Bluetooth is lower power, um, but also there's billions of chips with, um, you know, Bluetooth and Wi-Fi on the same chip. You know, it's like in your phones and stuff. So Bluetooth plays really well with Wi-Fi and oftentimes they're um, in the same product um, so that you can, you know, determine whether you're close to it. You could use Bluetooth to find the devices. Um, you could, you know, if you wanted to, um, and then use the the, uh, the Wi-Fi radio to actually transfer the data. Or if you were going to stream it, you would probably just keep um, Wi-Fi on. Sure. Uh, keep it rolling. Eric Bell wants to know, what are the advantages of uh, a Bluetooth mesh network compared to other meshes like Z-Wave and Zigbee? Yeah. So, um, you know, I... You know, I can just say why people are interested in, in um, you know, Bluetooth mesh. And a couple, a couple um, uh, points is um, one with our our Bluetooth models that we have; those are basically standardized applications um, that can run across um, the platform. And the fact that the that we um, we use our own radio, um, so we don't have to go outside to a different standards body to get changes to the radio. Um, and so that control of the the, the whole stack is of, of real value. Um, but really, you know, like I mentioned um, earlier, is that Bluetooth Mesh was actually created for the uh, commercial um, lighting space. And um, those different technologies already existed um, in that space, including proprietary Mesh Bluetooth mesh networks. Uh, so they were using Bluetooth radio and, and a company would just do their own. Um, and it turns out that they couldn't meet the high demands and unique um, uh, capabilities needed for lighting um, and having no single point of failure, being able to talk out to lots of devices, and then also having the native um, uh, connectivity with the phone, built into the phone, so you could provision these mesh networks um, from, a, you, you know, a, um, a uh, um, tablet or, or smartphone or um, laptop. Um, so those are, you know, some of the reasons um, why um, you might choose that. But really, again, it's specific to the actual application you want um, and why you might want to um, use um, one or the other. But Obviously, Bluetooth is very low power, um, and it the uh, speeds that it um, attains for that low power is is um, um, oftentimes one of the requirements that people have for it. Sure. Um, similar to the hockey hockey puck, Rick Garza wants to know if you can put Bluetooth in a golf ball, and wow. I would just like to kind of build on that and ask kind of about the durability of some of these. Uh, some of the equipment. I mean, I, I'm sure you could make one small and put in a golf ball, but is that going to hold up to somebody smacking it with a driver? Yeah, you know, great question. Um, so, you know, uh, so we're the standards organization. So it's it's actually our members who do the implementation. You know, they're the ones actually build the chips. You know, the silicon vendors build the chips. The OEMs, the the device makers, go well choose those chips um, and you know put them into a device. And there are a lot of different um, configurations and, and um, for these uh, different radios. So some, some um, silicon vendors make really, really tiny radios, really tiny radios. Um, and of course, they've got small antennas and, you know, they're, um, uh, the battery life, you know, is, is you know, uh, a long time because it's, um, you know, it's uh, very, it might be very energy um, efficient. 
some of our silicon vendors then for different areas like automotive and stuff, they might have uh, chips that can handle severe temperatures or severe vibrations. And so there's a lot of, you know, design and analysis into those areas or, um, and so really uh, it, it, it's a great question because that's where you would engage one of our silicon vendors mm. and understand, you know, which of their parts is made for those environments because, um, uh, Bluetooth and and they have experience, you know, in all these different areas, you know, ruggedized uh, vibration, you know, um, intrinsically safe environments. Um, so, you know, Bluetooth can do that, you know, um, in there. Um, we're seeing it in, um, it's already been done in um, mouthpieces and helmets for uh, football players. Um, we see it in a lot of different, we see it on the end of arc welders, Bluetooth radios, we see them, you know, in highly vibration uh, um, prone environments. So it really is a, a great discussion to have with uh, one of our silicon vendors. Great. Um, Isaac Boger asks, we are looking into using Bluetooth as part of our master's capstone project to locate missing people in search and rescue operations. Can location services be used with the device that isn't paired? And I think this is going to dovetail into kind of a security uh, question. So I'd love to hear. That. Yeah. So, um, so yes. So those beacons like in the, you know, the, the airport situation um, in your, in the um, uh, museum, you know, you get close to it. Those aren't paired. So they're using, there's three channels, there's, you know, for, for low energy, there's 40 channels and three of them um, are uh, basically for these, uh, they're called advertising, they're advertising channels, they're for broadcasting out. And those are, those are connectionless. So you could have connection, but, you know, you can only have so many of those, you know, uh, before, you, you know, that because it will, um, your device has to handle these um, connections. So it doesn't make sense for a thousand or 500 or you know, or whatever. Um, but uh, you, yeah, so you definitely, you could just use the beaconing part, the, um, the advertising channels for that. You don't have to pair it. If you did want it secure, you can do other mechanisms to um, encrypt the data that's coming out of the beacon, right? Um, so you could provision that. Um, so there's ways to, to do it so that you can have secure and also um, do beacons at the same time. So that's a great question. So. In, in the Bluetooth world, you know, we often think of connection and connectionless. And that, that was a great question. Okay. Uh, Wenbo Zong asks, um, currently we see that we can stream relatively high bit rate audio via Bluetooth when listening to music, but we still fall back to hands-free protocol with mono-channel audio when we want to use headset with microphone. Um, I know we are doing this mainly for backward compatibility, why hasn't there been a new standard put out for streaming stereo audio and microphone audio at the same time? Yeah, great question. So, so that's what this new LE audio is. So as part of this um, audio, um, the whole architecture has been changed to allow these types of situations. So when I mentioned the isochronous channels, you can have a left and right, and you can have a separate channel for control or for speakers. And this is this has been an issue with smart speakers and, and other devices. And it's really because the, the technology, it, all of these new cool features, um, you know, we're putting a strain on the existing architecture of audio for Bluetooth. Now, um, the infrastructure part of it, of this, the Bluetooth standard, allows for all of these types of scenarios where you can have now um, multiple streams going you can have multiple controls going you can um, have mixed of it and then also um, you know if um, you can actually interleave the packets internally um, so that you don't have to wait for one if you have got two devices going you don't have to wait for one device to finish before the other one does you can actually interleave the internal um, uh, um, PDUs, uh, internal packets inside the architecture. So all that's handled as part of this low energy to address um, those issues. So Bluetooth uh, audio, you'll be able to do more and more situations. And then also those new features of, you know, um, audio sharing um, in venues. So that, that's a great question too. So that is going to be, that's being resolved right now with our new um, standard. Got to love it when the answer is we're already doing that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, potentially last question, uh, also from Shane. 
Uh, you've mentioned using Bluetooth to prevent human robot collisions and drone collisions. Those are mission critical tasks. Is Bluetooth robust and reliable enough to trust lives to? Yeah, so again, so Bluetooth is a reliable communication, but you know, um, it's up to the OEM to, to decide, you know, is this the appropriate technology for me? I mean, Bluetooth is used in, you know, military equipment, it's used in implants into the body, it's used in a lot of different areas. But I, at that point, you know, I, we're just the standard of Bluetooth and, uh, but we rely on our members to um, come together and decide what features to add, what the, um, you know, what the capabilities are gonna be. So it's really a question for the, you know, for the OEMs to, to do that and talk to the silicon vendors. Um, on their on their um, solutions. That's a good question. Uh, one very last question this time. Okay. Uh, what is your favorite weird application that you've seen for Bluetooth? <laughs> Somebody doing something crazy with a radio that you didn't think would ever happen. Oh yeah, well, there's so many really cool ones. I mean, it's actually what makes this job really fun. Um, you know, uh, but I, I guess a couple that come to mind is, um, we actually had our, our Bluetooth, uh, a world event, um, we actually had NASA come talk um, and they actually, they were having an issue in the space station. It turns out that carbon dioxide, so you breathe out, mm -hmm. carbon dioxide doesn't dissipate in space, I guess, uh, like it does normally. And so it can kind of hover around people. And so they wanted to be able to um, create a device to monitor that. So he, uh, NASA talked about how they created a Bluetooth device to, to clip onto the collar and some videos uh um used to see that um it was clipped on the back of their neck on their suit and it would be monitoring the carbon dioxide exposure as they moved around the international space station i thought that was kind of a cool that's awesome a cool thing um and then we see it on i uh we uh have seen it on um bees putting um bluetooth uh radios on bees and tracking them and the hives and and i thought that was really a a great solution because um, uh, they're so critical to the ecosystem. And I thought that was kind of neat too. So those are just a couple, but yeah, I'm just amazed every day of the creativity that people can do. And it, you know, it is a testament to, it's a, it's a great technology and it's, um, you know, it's uh, on all, supported on all of the consumer devices, you know, your phones and stuff like that. So it is kind of cool. It, it, it finds its way onto lots of different um, um, devices. Yeah, we had a lot of people in the chat talking about how impressive it is, the ubiquity of Bluetooth, the availability. It's on every computer. It's in every cell phone. And I think it's in so much more stuff than people realize. So thank you for coming on here and telling us more about Bluetooth. Uh, I learned a ton. Also, thank you for supporting this whole series. We really appreciate that as well. Um, and that's unfortunately all we have time for, folks. I know there were more questions. Um, those were great questions. Really appreciate those. Uh, but we hope you'll join us next week. We are having Ijan Yao, uh, Managing Director of Alliance of Angels, talking about startup valuation. Always a hot topic. Um, hope to see you then. Again, Jim, thank you for your time. Thank uh, you, and Dave. until next time, see you guys. All right. See you, everyone.